How are you? Hope everything is going well. And welcome back to more pre-cal, exactly what you wanted to do, right? So if you start this warm-up, um, the using the ratio test, I want to make sure I did see um, a number of your videos. You did such a, a good job, and it is actually pleasant to hear all of your voices again. Um, I do want to make sure that those of you, I did see some er a couple people making an error with the ratio test. Um, the two most common errors are in the setup and then in the conclusion about the ratio. So if you want to go ahead and try this um, without me and pause, but meanwhile I'm going to go ahead and go through it. Set up, setting up the ratio test, remember, is setting up subsequent or consecutive terms, but they have to be the general consecutive terms. They can't be specific. In other words, if I expand this series starting with n is equal to 0, right, I'm going to get um, 2 to the 0 over 0 factorial, which is 1, plus 2 to the 1st over 1 factorial, plus 2 to the 2nd over 2 factorial, dot, 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 plus 2 to the n over n factorial, and then the next term is the 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. With the ratio test, you must use these two terms to do the ratio test. You cannot do any of these other ones because the ratio test is asking for the limit of the ratio between every term. What does that limit of the ratio go towards? So you're taking the limit of the ratio and you must do the 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 first and divide it by the 2 to the n to n um, divided by n factorial which of course is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal and by now I saw a number of you doing ratio test problems where you kind of you kind of feel the pattern right and you know that you have nice cancellations and that you end up taking the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 over n plus 1 and using your rational function brain remember that's really an n to the 0 this is bottom heavy so this limit goes to 0 now remember I told you that one of the first um, common errors with the ratio test is to not use the n's in the limit to use numbers you can't do that it has to be these two the n plus 1 and the n term. Then also there's trouble sometimes, another common error, and I saw many of you doing it right, but there's another common error in reading and interpreting this limit. Remember, we call this limit the ratio, the limit of the ratios, and this limit just needs to be less than 1 in order to converge, to prove convergence. <coughs> by the ratio test. Don't get confused with the limit comparison test, which when you get that limit, that limit has to be between 0 and infinity for you to conclude that both of your similar behaving series do the same thing. Here you need the limit of the ratio, it's not a common ratio, the limit of the ratio is less than 1. Also, um, there's no absolute value because the ratio test for numeric series is only used for series with positive terms. So that's why you don't have the absolute value bars like you do with a geometric test. All right. Now, I did this problem on purpose because I want you to refer to this and keep this out and look at this while we're doing starting the notes on what we're going to do today. And I do say notes because I live with this kid who happens to also be taking pre-cal and happens to also have to watch videos um, that his math teacher sends him and he asked me a question but he had no notes so when he didn't have his notes guess what I said to him I'll help you when you take notes on the videos <laughs> so I am assuming that you guys are taking notes 
All right, so Taylor series is a very, very deep subject. We are just going to touch the surface, and this is very important in BC calculus. Okay, in BC calculus, and this guy is Brooke Taylor. He has this fantastic wig, doesn't he? And Brooke Taylor is famous for coming up with the a formula to generate infinite series and they're called Taylor series. You are only going to be responsible. We are going to learn about three special ones. There are lots and lots and lots of series. There are lots and lots of Taylor series. We're going to be focusing today just on recognizing three special ones. That's why it says a few common functions, and then there's going to be this word, too, that we haven't seen before next to series. So, thinking about the warm-up, can you predict if the following numeric, and I've never made a big deal about writing this either, numeric series will converge by the ratio test. So remember, we showed in the warm-up We did the ratio test. We got the limit to be, right, when we did all our canceling and whatever, we got the limit as the ratio between consecutive terms went to zero, and therefore we got convergence, and we were top when we got that limit to be zero because we were, right, bottom heavy. So can you see that the only difference here in these two is that you're going to end up with a 10 in the numerator instead of a 2, but can you... Do you buy what I'm selling when I'm telling you that the ratio test will end up to also give you zero, right? And you'll be bottom heavy, and your numerator will just be a constant, 3 end of the zero, 10 end of the zero. Both of these are numeric convergent series. So remember, and I, you don't, we still don't quite know why and you won't for a very, very long time, know why convergence is the best. We want convergence series. So if we can hand somebody a whole bunch of convergence series, well, isn't that awesome? So look at this. Instead of saying 2 or 3 or 10, what if I just say x to the n over n factorial? This is no longer a numeric series. This is a power series, and we call this a power series. I got the power because I have replaced the number with a variable, which means I'm going to be able to generate, I'm going to plug in numbers for x and generate lots and lots of numeric series, depending upon what I choose for x. But I want to be careful and choose x to get me convergent, series. Right? This is what AP loves. <clears throat> what we love, sorry, and so does AP. So when I am given a power series, when I substitute numbers in for x, it creates numeric series, and it would be awesome if I knew that whatever number I'm plugging in gives me a convergence series. So I want to be able to give somebody a power series. I want to give somebody a power series, and then I want to give them what values of x can you plug into it to get a convergent numeric series. Right? So... I want to give you a power series, but then I also want to give you what x's create a numeric convergence series. So for a given x value, will that power series, how can I find those x values? Well, look at what I've set up here. And I only put the parentheses around just to group it, right? Can you see the ratio test here? I'm just doing the ratio test again, but I'm holding off on saying what x is. So I'm going to do the same freaking work that I did before. 
and I'm going to write this as x to the n times x to the first times n factorial times n plus 1, whoops, times n factorial times x to the n. And the same freaking stuff happens. The x's cancel out, the n factorials cancel out, and I end up with Now, here's the kind of cool limit thing. Notice that my limit involves n. There's an n. My limit does not involve x. So I can use a property of limits that says, you know what, since the this is really x over 1, take the x over 1 out front. Since that is not since my limit is not involved with that x, right? This is really an x over 1. Take that out front and then do the limit. Get it out of your way. Now, what is this? There's really an n to the zero. Isn't this still zero? But what do you have? What can't you forget? <clears throat> You've got an x over 1 times that limit, and that you evaluated that limit to be zero. And what must be true? In order to get convergence, what must be true? This statement needs to be less than 1. Well, what numbers can you plug in for x to make sure to satisfy that you're less than 1? Well, since you're multiplying times 0, it doesn't matter, does it? Woot! Right? I can put a gazillion in here for x times 0 and I'm left with 1. What does that say to me? That says to me that my original any x makes this true. So, remember the power series that I started with? Right? This power series converges for all x's. That is a huge gift. Any series of this form, 2 to the n over n factorial, 3 to the n over n factorial, 10 to the n over n factorial, right? 5 to the n over n factorial, a half to the n over n factorial. I don't have to run the ratio test. I have just proved that no matter what x you use, you will end up with a convergence series. Nicely done. Right? So, since that limit was less than 1, Always. Remember, it always equaled zero. Remember, we had x times the limit. Since that was always less than 1 because this limit was zero, regardless of whatever x is, I will always be less than 1 because of that limit. The original power series converges for all x. Further, because we're using x as input values, Put in 2 for x, put in 1 for x, put in 7 for x, put in 2.3 for x, put in a million for x. We can use function notation. Check that out. Right? 
And no matter what number you put in for x, you will get a convergent numeric series. Now let's expand the summation formula like we did in the warm-up to see what this looks like with the x in it. Right? This is a power series. Let's expand that power series. Plug in 0, and you get 1. Plug in 1, and you get x to the first over 1 factorial. Plug in 2, and you get x squared over 2 factorial. Plug in 3, and you get x cubed over 3 factorial. Hey, hey, what's, what's happening here? Um, I, I recognize that, right? Hey, what if, let's stop this summation nonsense for a second, and let me, and going to infinity, and let me just go over here and write down what I have here f of x is not equal to, because I'm cutting it off, because f of x is infinite. But And let me just write these in a different order. Um, um, hello, cubic function with a y-intercept of 1 at 0, 1. Zero, one, oh, what is happening? What is happening? Oh my goodness. Now, think about this. Think about this. What if, so again, so this looks darn familiar. Now, I chopped it off, but what if I didn't? Even if I didn't chop this off, Aren't I still going to have an x to the 4th, an x to the 5th, an x to the 6th, an x to the 7th, or whatever? It's a freaking polynomial, for God's sakes. This power series is, oh my God, equal to an infinite polynomial and I know a lot of things about polynomials and so do you. There is a reason you study polynomials. Algebra 1, Algebra 2, freak out. Polynomials are freaking important. Now wait a second. What if I had asked you to go back here what if over here in function land, I had said, I want you to plug in 1? Wouldn't that just be 1, 6, because 3 factorial is 6, times 1 cubed, plus 1 half, because 2 factorial is 2, times 1 cubed, I'm sorry, times, times 1 squared, which is just 1, plus 1, plus this one. Right? So wait a second. Now remember, this is only approximate because this series really goes on forever and ever, but wait a second. You just found a partial sum. And what is this partial sum? Right? What do you get here? Isn't this, this is just... 1 sixth plus 3 sixth, which is 4 sixth, plus 1 plus 1, 2 and 4 sixths, right? If I did my math right. So what is that? 2 and 2 thirds, which is 8 thirds. So hold the phone. This is an infinite power series. It's a sum. And remember I told you you couldn't find sums of infinite series unless it was geometric. But hold on. I can find some partial sums of this power series. And this, remember, what did this represent when I put in 1? What did that represent? 
that represents putting 1 in for this x. So it is when I f of 1 I don't know what that infinite sum is, but I know that the partial sum, right, going to the 1, 2, 3, 4th term, I know the 4th partial sum is 8 thirds. I probably could keep going, couldn't I? Get a couple more partial sums. Well, this is just nuts. That infinite sum is a freaking polynomial. Now it's an infinite polynomial, but I can cut off that polynomial and plug in a number and get a partial sum. Right, so this is what I just showed you. So once again, what is f of 1? f of 1 means putting 1 in for x. Expanding this, first term, second term, third term, fourth term, right? What is that infinite sum? Well, I don't know, but I know when I go that far, that sum is 8 thirds. Right? So I could say then that f of 1 is approximately going, right, stopping this to infinity, going to right, going from 0, 1, 2, and 3, right, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So f of 1 isn't exactly 8 thirds, but it's kind of close to 8 thirds. What if I kept going? What if I said, well, you know what? Instead of stopping after 3, Right? Instead of saying, remember I just did a 3, what if I did this? To 5. Right? And then, what if I did to 12? And remember, we had just done this one. And we got 8 thirds, right? Which was 2.6666666. Well, how about this number? How about when I added a couple more? So what I want you to do on your calculator is I want you to add 1. right, plus 1 over 2, plus 1 over, right, these are all factorials, right, so this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, add those numbers up. Then I want you to add these. So when I did these, I got not 2.66 something, but I got 2. Point, oh, I can't read my writing. 2. Um G Anybody recognize that number? Hello? Whoops. 
Hello, 2.7, Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson, oh my gosh, what is the limit of the partial sums approaching? <gasps> Naturally, oh my goodness, the limit of the partial sums of the infinite series of 1 to the n over n factorial was e to the first. And remember I was plugging in f of 1. Oh my lanta. This function in terms of x, which is in an infinite power series, of x to the n over n factorial, factorial is the same as e to the x. Oh, snap! I mean, out of nowhere. e just came out of nowhere. And again, what you're doing is you're just plugging these values, right? If you don't believe me, if you weren't with me, put these just into your calculator. It ain't that hard. Try a couple numbers in between, right? Go from 0 to 10, go from 0, then go 0 to 12 or whatever, but you're eventually just going to keep getting E. Wow! And E to the X, which is irrational. E is a transcendental number. This is a transcendental number. I'm sure I'm not spelling transcendental right. Don't care. A transcendental number is the same thing as an infinite series, but that is the same thing as an infinite polynomial. You might be going, so? Well, look at what I can do. I already showed you e to the first. What if I asked for f of 2. That is saying what is e squared. e squared is exactly equal to the infinite series of 2 to the n over n factorial. I can't plug in all of these, right? I can't, but when I plug in 0, I get 1 plus 2 to the first over 2 factorial plus 2 squared over 2 factorial plus 2 cubed over 3 factorial plus 2 to the fourth over 4 factorial and maybe I'm done and I stop there and when you do you are going to get an approximation not equals you're going to get an approximation of e squared. I don't know how you think your calculator, when you push e squared on your calculator, I don't know how you think it comes up with that number, and there's no reason before that now that you should have known that, but you know what your calculator is programmed with? The power series. Not the infinite power series, it can't, but it just takes out a whole bunch of terms of the power series, and when you push e squared, push e squared on your calculator, that's what it's plugging into, a freaking polynomial. Right? That's nuts. Let me take you here and show you graphically what's going on. I've graphed 1, f of x is equal to 1. That is the first term in the power series, x to the n over n factorial. The next term is x to the first over 1 factorial. The next term is x squared divided by 2 factorial. The next term, oh wait, I don't want to do that yet. Let me graph this. Look at that. A parabola, right? Hello, x squared over 2 plus x plus 1. I'm going to add another term of the infinite power series, which is a polynomial. x cubed divided by 
3 factorial. What does that look like? Oh, shocker, it looks like a cubic function. Y-intercept at 1, swooshing off because the leading coefficient is positive. How about next term? Oops, sorry. Gee, what does this look like? A fourth degree. How about one more? Ah. Oh, look, it's a fifth degree. But look at that right side. Right? Look at that right side. It, it didn't change a lot. Whoa. Did you just see what happened? Let me change colors here. Infinite polynomial. Psych, it's not infinite. I only have one, two, three, four, five, six terms. Six terms. It is a fifth degree polynomial with a leading coefficient that is positive. So there's the behavior. But look at e to the x. Look how closely it matches. Now it doesn't match over here, but every time you add a term, Right? Look at where it starts to diverge from the green. Look what happens when I add another term. Right? Do you see down here how the right side still looks like there's no change and what's happening over here is I got a little bit closer. Right, so I think you can imagine, you can see that as the powers change, this green piece is going to flop up and down, up and down, up and down, right? But it's eventually going to match closer and closer as I go off, right? More and more. That's freaking nuts. So, what are we trying to do here? We showed that... The graph of this infinite polynomial as you add more and more terms right it starts off with just one but then this side the right side swooshes off And the left side goes down or up, depending upon whether you have an even or odd power. But as you go off to infinity, the right side matches e to the x exactly, as long as you go off to infinity. If you stop the infinite series and plug in a number for x, you get an approximate, but it's a pretty good freaking approximate. That is one of the major uses of Taylor series. So what if I, if I ask you to use the six, first six terms of the Taylor series representation of e to the x to approximate e to the 1.1, this is what I'm asking. First six terms will mean I'll stop here at 5 because I start at 0. So what that means is I want 1.1 to the first, I'm sorry, to the 0 over 0 factorial.
right? That's one, two, three, four, five, six terms. Stop. This is you truncating. You're cutting off the infinite series, which is why you have to write an equivalent song. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, equivalent sign here. Now, the truncated one is exactly equal to this number. So you can go ahead and write down this, you know, you just plug this number, plug these values into your calculator and give me an approximation. And then what I want you to do is with your calculator, I want you to use your calculator button and calculate act, and use the calculator to give you e to the 1.1 and I want you to compare these two. Compare those two. So let me give you a moment to do that. I'll do it with you. 1.1 to the 0 over 0 factorial is 1 plus 1.1 divided by 1 which is 1.1 plus 1.1 squared divided by 2 factorial, plus 1.1 cubed divided by 6, right? That's 3 factorial. I mean, you can hit 3 and then get the button if you want. You know, you know where that is, math, arrow over to probability and down to choice 4. Plus 1.1 to the 4th divided by 4 factorial, which is 24, plus 1.1 to the fifth, divided by 120, which is 5 factorial. So using the Taylor series approximation, I got 3.001, go out about 4, when I hit e to the, right? e to the 1.1. So using only six terms of a freaking infinite series, I got e to the 1.1 to the hundredths place. And all you have to do is add some more terms. And again, when you push e to the 1.1 on your calculator, it is programmed with the Taylor series representation. It's just got, I don't know how many terms, a lot, but that's why however many it takes to get out that far, right? Insane in the membrane. Let's check out these series. So if you haven't figured it out, e to the x is a special Taylor series. So our first special Taylor series is e to the x. Let's look at this one. So it looks a little crazy, right? At first you're like, ah, I don't know what's going on. But remember, this is a power series because of this x. It is an infinite power series. So what I want to do is replace this with zero. This is something you'll start to recognize. All this little factor does here is alternate the signs. Alternate the signs of every term. So with n being equal to zero, the first term, negative one to the zero is one, right? So your first term will be positive, but then your second term will be negative. So that piece just alternates your signs, and maybe you kind of know what this does, the power, right? That's odd powers divided by odd factorials, isn't it? So I wrote out a couple of terms there, right? Negative, right? I plugged in 0 here. 2 times 0 is 0, plus 1 is 1. So that's x to the first over 1 factorial. So this is really x to the first over 1 factorial. Oh my gosh, that's a freaking polynomial. 
right? It's an infinite polynomial, and notice that the powers are all odd, and the factorials are all odd. Now I want you to go to your graphing calculator, and I want you to put those terms into y1, just those ones. So I want you to put x I don't know what 7 factorial is. I'm good to about 5. Go to your window. Changes to about negative 2 to 2. And hit graph. Now this is a seventh degree polynomial, right? So you shouldn't be surprised, and with a negative leading coefficient, so you shouldn't be surprised at what that looks like. But I want you to add one more term. What would the next term be? Positive, right? X to the ninth divided by nine factorial. Hmm. Oh, look, that behavior is slightly different. Hey. Huh. Gee. Can you see starting at, if you kind of look at the center of that picture and radiate out, and you can imagine adding terms and terms and terms, what's going to happen to those, en those ends, right, as they flip up and down? Gee, what does that kind of sort of remind you of? Make sure you're in radians. Check this out. Oh my goodness. Now, notice when this graphs doesn't look anything like sine. Till about now. Till about now and then it doesn't. But that is the power here, ha, pun intended, of the power series. Right? This infinite series, this infinite power series is a freaking polynomial and is exactly equal to sine x. Sine x, think about sine x. To get exact values you, where there were only a handful of, of values that we knew exactly the value of. Everything else, where does it come from? I need my calculator. Well, how does your calculator know? Your calculator is programmed with this power series and not a whole lot of them, a whole lot of terms. So. How do I approximate sine of 1.1? By plugging 1.1 into these x's. Wow. What do you think this one is? Again, you have a sine alternator here. This is a power series, but instead of the powers being odd, what are the powers? Even powers divided by even factorials. 
Remember, sine was odd powers divided by odd factorials. Remember, E was all integer powers divided by all integer factorials and all positive, right? There was no sign alternator. Hey, hey. Something just, I just remembered something from what I did in AAF and pre-cal. The graph of sine has what kind of symmetry? Uh. Odd symmetry. How about the graph of cosine? What kind of symmetry does it have? Even symmetry, that's not a coincidence. Isn't that freaking cool? Here's a few terms of not sine, but cosine of x. Wow. These are your three special Taylor series that you need to know. And you are going to be asked to approximate values of E, sine, and cosine using a few of these terms. So, for instance, use the first five terms of the power series for sine x to approximate sine of, pi, of pi over 3. Here's what I expect to see from you. You won't be told what the power series is. You need to know that sine x is approximately odd powers of x. One, two, three, four, five, divided by the odd factorials of x. I'm sorry, the odd factorials that match. And you need to know that the signs alternate positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. Sine x is not exactly equal to this because you have truncated, you have cut off the infinite polynomial here. But you are now going to plug in pi over 3 for x. Now, since you... I had, if you follow directions, you have this in y equals 1. Right? If you, on your calculator, you have this in y equals 1, so you can just go to your calculator and hit vars, y vars. Right? We went all the way out to the ninth. So glad you get to hear Mr. Getz singing. Right? And that is exactly equal to Now, go to your calculator and do two things. Your calculator's home screen hit sine, as long as, of course, you're in radians, 3 pi divided by 2. I'm sorry, I said 3 pi. I meant pi divided by 3. Right, so what does my calculator say? Look how many decimal places. 
of accuracy I got with only freaking five terms. Also, of course, you know that the sine of pi over 3 is irrational, and it's the square root of 3 over 2. Hit the square root of 3 over 2 on your calculator. And you're going to get OMG. So, using your three special Taylor series, you do have to know their pattern, and you need to know how to use it to approximate, and you need to realize that this is what your computers and your calculators are using to approximate these irras irrational and transcendental values. Crazy! Here is a second application of our special Taylor series. Another reason that it is worth your while to know your your three specials, three special Taylor series, is that I can use my Algebra 1 skills and create a bunch of other not-so-famous series without having to know what their actual formula is. I can start with my one of my three knowns. So somebody asked me to write out the first five terms of the Taylor series for e to the 2x. Well, that ain't e to the x. In calculus, I'll teach you how to get that by yourself, but even after that, I'm going to ask you in calculus to say, don't do that. Don't go through all the work to make this series yourself. Start with e, e to the x, then use composition. e to the x is not equal to e to the 2x, but you took e to the x and composed the function 2x into it. In Algebra 1, I said this. I said, what if f of x is equal to e to the x and g of x is equal to 2x? What is f composed with g? And you said that's e to the 2x, right? So, since e to the x is exactly equal to this infinite polynomial with a bunch of x's into it, just compose term by term. <gasps> Isn't that crazy? Now, you should clean this up a little, but you really don't, really, this is the important piece that you knew that e to the 2x was just a composition of 2x into e to the x, so you composed into all of the x's, right? So this would really be 1 plus 2x plus 4x squared over 2, which would reduce to 2x squared, plus 8x cubed over 6, which would reduce to 4 over 3, plus 16x to the 4th over 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, so this would be, right, you would have an 8, so that would be 2 over 3, because you would cancel this 8 with the 8 here. Right? How about another one? Write out the first five terms of the Taylor series for f of x is equal to x sine x. Well, this is a product. And I taught you in Algebra 2 that you can take two functions and multiply them together now, can't you? So if f of x, whoops, sorry. If f of x is equal to x times sine x, remember sine x is equal to the odd powers, alternate the signs, Well, I can write equals if I do this. 
Now what do I want to do? I don't want the series for x, I'm sorry, sine x. I want the series for x sine x. So I'm going to multiply this side of the equation by x, and I'm going to multiply every single one of these terms by x. So what do I get? x squared minus x to the fourth over 3 factorial plus x to the sixth over 5 factorial minus x to the eighth over 8 factorial, whoops, 7 factorial, plus x to the tenth over 10 factorial plus dot dot dot, and that is equal to x sine x, which is what they asked me for. But I just used sine x, what I knew about sine x to get me that answer. Last one. How about writing out the first five terms of the Taylor series for cosine of x squared? Now remember this is not all of cosine squared, right? I'd have to use parentheses. This is cosine of x squared. It's another composition. I'm just going to write out up here what I know cosine x. Cosine x is even, so it's x to the 0 power, which is 1, minus x squared over 2 factorial. One, two, three, four, five. Now, what is true? I'm not multiplying by x. This is another composition, right? Again, think about from algebra. y equals cosine of x. y1. y2 is equal to x squared. What is the composition of y1 compose y2? You take x squared and you shove it in for x. Right? So into, if that's cosine x, cosine of x squared therefore cosine of x squared is this same series but instead of the x shove in x squared. There is no x in the first term x squared squared over 2 factorial, x squared to the 4th over 4 factorial, x squared to the 6th. So of course this is actually x to the 4th, this is actually x to the 8th, that's x to the 12th, and that's x to the 16th. Woot! Impressive. So, uh, your homework is a handout that goes along with this um, where you are just using your three famous Taylor series to approximate values of E, sine, and cosine, and then the second part asks you to do some manipulation of your famous power series, right? And you're either going to be multiplying, dividing, composing, right, um, to create new ones. All right, have a swell day. Oh, I forgot I had a summary slide. The following series converge for all x. Now, I proved it with the ratio test for this one. I did the proof at the very beginning to show that you could plug in any x here and get a convergent numeric series. I didn't prove it for sine x and cosine x. Um, because they have alternating signs, so that's something we'll do in, um, in calculus. We'll prove this with a version of the ratio test that allows us to deal with alternating signs. But I am giving you that it doesn't matter what x you plug in. Any x that you replace in these series, you will converge to the function e to the x for all x. This infinite series, this infinite polynomial is exactly sine x for all sine x. This infinite polynomial, which is an infinite series, is exactly equal and, and the graph will converge right on top of 
the graph of cosine x. Again, there are many more Taylor series. There are even some more famous ones, but those are the first and main ones. So you may think of this Taylor, but know that we think about Brooke Taylor. Good old Brooke. So here you can see, here's the three famous ones. Even in calculus, these are still ranked one, two, and three. There are other famous ones, but not nearly as common or used as often as E sine and cosine. Again, what Brooke, what Brooke did, I mean, so he has some famous, but he has a formula that lets me generate a Taylor series for, you know, I don't have to memorize them. I can just create them, right? But that's for calculus. All right. Have a good rest of your day.